All right. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate being here. Why, why is it showing my taskbar? Well, you're going to get to see my taskbar because I'm not going to mess around with it. It's not supposed to be on that screen. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the jQuery Foundation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the efforts and, and things that we've been doing to, uh, to make things better for you as web developers and, uh, and what those kinds of things encompass, not just in terms of code, but in terms of the kind of larger industry efforts that we go through to make sure that web developers can do a better job at their jobs. Now, one thing that seems to be a meme going around nowadays is that jQuery, jQuery is in jeopardy. There's just there's something going on with jQuery. Well, I guess it is kind of in jeopardy. If the category is web development, then the answer is this JavaScript library is used by 77% of the top 10,000 websites. And of course, the answer is jQuery. This is what jQuery's usage looks like. 77.2% of the top 10,000 websites use jQuery. You can see that when you go deeper into the internet, there's still a ton of people using jQuery. It's really kind of a given. If you're a web developer, you need to know jQuery. You probably are going to need to know a lot of other things. And if you look at the topics of our talks, all the talks that you're going to see over the next couple of days, they're not just about jQuery. They're about solving problems uh, as web developers and making sure that the web platform delivers the value that you and your companies need as you're trying to figure out how to, how to make things work better for you. Um, jQuery UI. Another, uh, you know, when you want to easily be able to pick up UI widgets and not have to build them all from scratch, jQuery UI does that for you. You'll also notice 21% of the top 10,000 websites use jQuery UI. Uh, people, uh, programmers sometimes like to reinvent the wheel, but sometimes they prefer to just buy around one. And it's even better when you're using jQuery because you don't have to buy it. All you have to do is download it. Now, I want to clear up a little bit of confusion. This is actually, Bill Cosby is one of my favorite guys, but uh, this is, a, uh, <laughs> this is a, uh, a capture that someone got that said, confused Cosby. And of course, there was always an image for every good captcha. But when, when someone hears the name jQuery Foundation, they think, oh, that's just about jQuery. But that's not quite true. Think of the Gates Foundation. Is the Gates Foundation about Bill and Melinda Gates? Well, no, no. It's about the efforts that Bill and Melinda Gates uh, want to sponsor and want to uh, foster in their, in their foundation. And so I, I picked a few phrases out of their, the letter that's on their website. Um, and there, there are things that most foundations do. Uh, our foundation is teaming up with partners to take on tough challenges. For each issue we work on, we fund innovative ideas. And an essential role in philanthropy is to make bets on promising solutions. So if you look at the mission of the jQuery Foundation, um, we have very similar kinds of aspirations. We want to improve the open web. We want to make the web accessible for everyone um, through open source. And we want to work with the standards bodies to build those standards so that web developers uh, can rely on them. And we want to work with individuals and organizations to implement the code, the open source code, that you can use. Um, we're not alone in these goals. I, uh, Brian LaRue, who uh, works on PhoneGap, now Cordova, uh, at one point said, we have two high-level goals. One is the web is a first-class development platform, and we absolutely believe that as well. We want the web, uh, you know, instead of people saying, well, let's write uh, an app and put it in the App Store for Apple and Microsoft and Google and BlackBerry and, you know, 15 other phones, we want people to develop for the web, and then just users should be able to go with their web browsers and get there. And that's the promise of the web platform. And we, we don't want to lose sight of that. Whenever people say, well, apps are better, well, the question is, what can we do to make the web platform just as good? And the other one 
is a really interesting perspective. It's like the ultimate purpose of PhoneGap, and really the ultimate purpose of the work we do, is, is to get out of the way. We shouldn't need to be there. The reason why jQuery exists is because the web platform initially was imperfect, and there were varying uh, large differences between the way browsers worked, and, and that prevented people from just being able to use the direct APIs. So ultimately, you know, what we're trying to do is create tools that allow us to experiment and cur converge on better standards, and those standards become the platform, not the libraries in between. So you know, another way to put this is we want to make it easier for web developers to do their jobs by implementing better standards, browsers, platforms, languages, tools, APIs, and education. Now, the fact that you're here shows the education part, right? We're, we want to, to make sure that everyone knows how to best use the web technologies that are out there today, and also to prepare for the ones that will be out there tomorrow. There's some companies that have been helping us in this mission. Um, we have two founding members, uh, WordPress and IBM, who, who sponsor us. Uh, financially and through other means of support, uh, including people contributing at the, at the board and the uh, team level. And we have uh, members that provide services, for example, MaxCDN. If you've ever used code.jQuery.com to get a copy of jQuery, you're going through MaxCDN's content delivery network. Media Temple provides all of the servers that we use uh, to actually host the content that we have. Uh, you saw WordPress in the previous slide. WordPress, our, our uh, content network is actually, our content is based off of a WordPress uh, setup, which is highly customized for our needs. And WordPress help us build that. And our gold members here uh, also provide financial support. But the people who really make it so that you can download that copy of jQuery are, are the team members who actually develop the source. And this is all the jQuery Foundation uh, team members. They're all over the world. So if you look, uh, you know, we have team members that are not just the United States and Canada, but everywhere. And I think that's important as well because many of the problems that, that we face when we talk about the web have to do with things like uh, the issues of different time zones and formatting of currencies and languages. And uh, sometimes as uh, US developers, we forget about those things. We also quite often as developers, if you're a, a fully abled person, forget that there are people who are visually impaired or motor impaired that aren't able to use the web in the same way that you might be able to use them. And a lot of our uh, emphasis is to make sure that everyone has access to the web. So let's look at a, a series of different things that the jQuery Foundation works on. The ones that I think we are most identified with, the ones that I sometimes think um, people think we are exclusively involved in, are the ones with the words jQuery in their name, jQuery Core, jQuery UI and jQuery mobile. But we also uh, support the development of the QUnit testing framework. There's a great new 2.0 release coming out soon that I think is really going to make it easier for people to do unit tests. And we want to evangelize that people should do unit testing and not just kind of release things out with no testing whatsoever. Uh, Globalize, which addresses some of the problems that I mentioned with uh, formatting and parsing of currencies and uh, international languages. Um, Sizzle, which is our selector engine, which is included in jQuery, and documentation. I mean, none of this is useful unless you can figure out how to use it. And there have been plenty of good software projects out there where no one takes the time to document them well or document them fully. And we want our projects to be represented by high quality documentation. But at the next level, of things that we're working on. We have accessibility, I mentioned already, internationalization, localization, and we're also trying to work on a common CSS framework. One of our visions for how we want to um, uh, help developers is that there should be a, a common set of uh, CSS um, use in terms of design that would allow people who are using different widgets, different uh, frameworks 
to essentially start with one set of markup and be able to use that whether they're using jQuery UI or Angular or Ember and really essentially make that, make that code choice without having to completely change the way they're working on their markup. And we think it's an attainable thing. We've been talking with some of the other groups to see if we can, uh, if we can make this happen. But it's an example where it goes just beyond JavaScript code. It really goes to the, disc the issues that are involved with web development in general. Now, one other level down, or one level up, I suppose, is, uh, is standards. We're working with the standards organizations. We have members in the uh, JavaScript ECMA TC39 team. Uh, we work with the web standards organizations like the W3C. We work directly with the browser makers. We work not only to, uh, to ensure that they work with future standards, but they actually implement present standards because sometimes they're a little slow at that. Or they implement, it, they implement something, but they have bugs in it. And because we are a layer of software between the user and the browser, quite often we get the reports that you send saying, this isn't working right when I use it in jQuery. Well, so quite often it's not our problem. It's not something that we uh, can fix, but we certainly can report it and advocate a fix to the people who write, uh, who write the browser. Uh, finally, uh, we're working with project collaborations. I mentioned the common CSS framework. Uh, we're working with Dojo on several things, uh, one of which I'll mention here later in the, in the talk. And we're working with some other organizations uh, essentially to, uh, again, make sure that we're not, as open source developers, we have limited time. A lot of time we're donating uh, our, our time uh, to implement these things. We don't want three or four people to kind of waste time implementing essentially the same thing. If, if possible, we would rather collaborate and try to incorporate all the needs into one project or maybe two projects that can get the job done so that we can focus our efforts. And that kind of project collaboration is something, because uh, developers tend to be introverts who sometimes don't like talking to each other, we want to kind of make these introverted people realize that it's to everyone's advantage and it will make them much more heroic in the community if they can just collaborate to, uh, you know, to deliver the solutions rather than create their own little firewalled piece that doesn't work with anything else. Now I mentioned standards. Um, you know, uh, there's some things when, when you think of standards, uh, we've been through a rocky time in the web, and sometimes you know you think of standards, and you think of I don't know some things that are not so good. You say CSS is a standard; it's it's a good standard. You know, we it's like don't lay out with tables, and then we'll do grids, and then we'll do flex boxes, and you know we'll keep coming up with things that somehow will solve the problem that we thought we'd solve with the previous thing. Um, it's not because the people working on it are not smart. The problem is that standards are really hard work. Um, there's, there's a chicken and egg problem here, right? You as a developer say, I'm not really going to, like um, web components, good example, right? So you take web components. Everybody's excited about this idea that you'll be able to create new elements and they encapsulate all the functionality that you need to implement this particular um, thing. Uh, and, and everybody says, web components are going to be awesome when they get here. Now, obviously, you know, if you're going to build a whole project on web components, it has to be implemented everywhere you want to use it. Or you'll have to include some giant shims and polyfills. So a lot of times developers don't see these things until they've already been implemented across many browsers. And at that point, it's usually too late to incorporate any significant changes. Once it gets to that point, everybody says, well, you're right. You know, had we really thought about what was going to happen, we would have changed it. But we're going to have to fix that in Web Components 2.0, and we're going to have to fix it in a way that allows the Web Components 1.0 stuff to continue to live because there's already code out there that's built with that in mind. So we end up in this cycle of building things that kind of work, sort of, most of the time, and then when people get out there and try to use them, um, it doesn't work the way we wish it had worked. Um, 
How many people have used application cache? Uh, I don't believe you because I see your eyes and they're not gouged out. Um, you know the problem, though. If application cache is an example of something where, uh, with the best of intentions, somebody said, this will be really cool. We'll create this manifest so that the app will be able to kind of store all of its information locally and then occasionally go out the internet. And it didn't work. It didn't work at all. I mean, it just, every time anybody tries to use it, they run into a billion problems. So those are the kind of things that the jQuery Foundation is trying to avoid. We want to make it so that a standard, uh, as much as possible in version 1.0, can be usable and that you won't be pulling your hair out uh, when, you, when you're trying to use it. Now, one of the ways we do that is through something called the Extensible Web Manifesto. And it says, you know what? When you try to build, when you try to boil the ocean, it's really difficult because, you know, despite global warming, raising the temperature of the ocean all at once at the same time is pretty difficult. So instead, let's take a cup of water and try to boil that. Um, and to do that, the equivalent here with the web is we're going to pick some low-level things that we want to implement. So instead of trying to do app cache, where it tries to touch a lot of aspects of, of development, um, let's just figure out a way that we can intercept requests as they go out on the wire, and we can either satisfy them from a cache, or we can fabricate them if the user's offline. So we're going to figure out a way to use lower level primitives that will allow you to build higher level things in JavaScript. Um, and those, those higher level things, if they become so compelling and so valuable to people, we can implement those directly in the browser, but we'll have something that works to start with to make sure that our concept is proven. Now, a lot of times when people hear that, they go, well, wait a minute. Um, aren't, aren't native APIs faster? Like, I, I thought everybody knows that C code is faster than JavaScript code. Well, it turns out quite often it's not. Uh, it may be a little slower. Sometimes it's even faster, believe it or not. Uh, Jay Dalton, who, who created Lodash, uh, has a ton of benchmarks where he'll show that this piece of JavaScript code actually is faster than the equivalent method that's implemented inside the browser. Now, one of the reasons that that happens is because JavaScript and its just-in-time compilation has gotten fast enough that it's approaching the speed of native code anyway. So we aren't really losing anything with a native web, uh, with the uh, web manifesto. We're not really losing anything by adding a small layer of JavaScript that uses low-level primitives. And the other thing is, whenever these pieces of native functionality break, what's the first thing we have to do? We have to wrap them up in JavaScript jQuery is basically trying to fix the native APIs. So even when we try to do it right in native code, the majority of the time it ends up having to be wrapped by some piece of JavaScript. Uh, an example of that um, from jQuery is jQuery trim. Um, there's, a, there's a method called string trim that was added to uh, JavaScript in, uh, in ECMAScript 5. And uh, so many browsers got it wrong that we ended up just going back to our own implementation in JavaScript because there were enough browsers that wouldn't tri trim the string properly. You think, you know, gee, that's pretty easy. That's like falling off a log. Well, obviously, some browsers cannot fall off a log because they couldn't trim strings correctly. But let me, let me give you, with the rest of the time I have, um, some examples of how we advocate for web developers. And in particular, I want to cover uh, touch events and pointer events. Um, how many of you develop for mobile and use touch events? All right. Um, just to give you a background on, on, on touch events, they were created by Apple. They were created for use with the iPhone, really the first super popular touch device. And Apple didn't have to ask anybody on how it might be, those might be implemented. They just sat down. They're smart people. They figured it out. They didn't talk to anybody. They released a product that used them. And that, you know, that's like, that's kind of like 
The easiest way to do something is don't ask anybody for, for permission, just go ahead and do it. Uh, touch events are not a standard. Um, and in fact, Apple has made noise. Uh, the W3C has tried to standardize uh, touch uh, events several times, and the Apple has made noise saying they will not relinquish patent rights uh, for touch events. Now, it turned out there was an implementation in WebKit, which, is the, uh, which doesn't mean that they relinquished any patent, patent, patent rights. But, uh, and other people have implemented touch events. It's just that Apple still has never said, well, we, it doesn't mean that we will let you do it. At, at some point in the future, we may sue you. So, but the main problem isn't the intellectual property issue. From a developer standpoint, hey, you know, if they sue Google, let them duke it out. It doesn't matter. Uh, the problems for developers are the technical issues. So let's look at some of those technical issues. Um, some of them are problems of our own making, and this happens a lot with um, anytime there's one example of something, a de the developers will say, okay, you know, the iPad screen is always 1024 by 768. It's a truism, you know? And then, of course, the new version comes out and it's a different size. And you see this happening yet again with the iPhone 6, where now there's different screen sizes and apps won't work right because, you know, native apps don't have a rendering engine that can figure out how to make things bigger or smaller quite as easily as we do. Um, but those de bad developer assumptions come from things like, if this device has touch, it clearly won't have a mouse. And that's true for maybe uh, an iPad or uh, you know, an iPhone, but it's not true in general. Uh, if you have a Chromebook or this Windows notebook that I'm working with right now, I can touch it and it generates touch events, but it has a trackpad and I can plug in a mouse. So I can get pointers lots of different ways. Um, but touch, uh, you know, so the other problem is that when Apple decided they were going to start um, using touch events, they said, well, we still need to make pointer work somehow because there's so many things out there that expect a click to occur. So they do this thing where they fake mouse events. And that just creates this whole, like, Anytime you, anytime you try to create an alternate reality is difficult. So these mouse events that touch creates, the reason why people would want to say, well, gee, I'm only going to listen for touch events is because when you start listening for touch and mouse, you start getting duplicate functionality if you're listening for both. The other problem is that touch is a whole new event model. It doesn't, it, it, the events have different behavior and different semantics than a mouse does. So as a developer, if you're used to the way mouses work and things like drag and drop and mouse over, they don't work the same way with touch. Um, I mentioned the problem with simulating mouse actions. Um, when you have a device like the one I have here where you have touch on the screen and mouse available as well, it's a real mess because was it a real mouse that was moving around or was it just the result of something that happened when I touched the screen. It makes it really difficult to do things correctly. And in fact, when Microsoft recently implemented touch events, they turned the functionality on for their phone devices and tablets, but they could not turn it on for desktop because of this very problem, that when somebody touched the screen, they didn't want it to fake a mouse event and then make you think that the tab tablet had been touched. And there's more, there's more problems, right? There's, like you thought, oh, that's all there is? Well, we can solve those problems. Um, it requires JavaScript to be in the critical po code path. As much as I love JavaScript, um, there's certain things that if you, want the, if you want a device to be responsive, the last thing you want to do is be continually calling back to JavaScript to ask it permission or ask it what to do. By default, you'd kind of like the device to know what it needs to do, and then you be able to ask it, hey, you know, can you do me a favor, like an on-scroll event, right? When the scrolling is occurring, I want you to call me back when the scrolling occurs. But there are some things the way touch event work that the way you signal that you want to stop scrolling and actually handle the event is it has to call a handler, and that is where you call prevent default and you prevent the scrolling from occurring. 
Um, that means that you have to synchronously, before you do the scrolling, you have to synchronously call and say, hey, is it okay for me to scroll now? And then if that handler takes like half a second, then the scrolling won't happen for half a second. That's a horrible performance problem. Um, the other problem is that there's no standard. So the way this has been implemented is everybody looks at somebody else's implementation, generally Apple's or Chrome's implementation, and says, how do they do it? We'll try to make it work something like the same as their, their implementation. Uh, but even then, there are problems, design problems here, and all the players have yet to agree on the way to solve the problem and are, are not even sure there is a way to solve the problem. Um, in particular, how do you expand other pointer types? How do you deal with the problem of, of mouse? How do you deal with someone who wants to use um, you know, a camera and gestures as a pointer device? You know, is that touch? Do you fake that as touch or do you fake that as mouse or do you pass something through that actually makes it look like the real, um, you know, the real pointer type that you're using, which is a camera with gestures? And in the end, it's really hard to fix these problems because the cow has left the barn, the train has left the station, what other acronym, whatever thing can I use? Well, anyway, it's too late because all of this code is already deployed with touch, making these assumptions, some of them bad assumptions, and any change you make ends up breaking the web because the assumptions and the code that makes those assumptions is not going to be happy if you change all the rules after the game has started. So this is one of those standards where we didn't, well, one of these de facto standards, one of these things where we just seem to keep hitting ourselves. <laughs> but it's not our fault. So I don't know. I, I saw this, and I just thought it was great. Um, so what am I advocating? What are, you know, uh, we sat down, uh, the jQuery Foundation, the Dojo Foundation, um, and several other players sat down and talked to the browser makers and said, we don't think this is really the best course of action to stay with touch events. Chrome wants to stay with touch events right now. They, they have no interest in uh, implementing pointer events. Um, so because of that, what we'd like to have is that browsers implement pointer events, use a polyfill uh, so that the older browsers that are still using touch will turn those into a pointer event. Uh, Google has already created a polyfill to do this. And uh, we just heard yesterday that they are probably OK with giving this to a foundation. Hopefully, they'll give it to us. And we'll be able to continue development on it to provide support for, um, for pointer events on devices that don't have pointer events. Uh, browsers will continue to support touch events because, again, the cow has left the bar and the train has left the station. We can't take that functionality away right now because there's enough code out there that depends on it. But we'll say, hey, whatever the problems are with touch events, we're not going to try to go back and back patch it because we know it's a compatibility nightmare. And we won't break existing code that way. And eventually, touch events become deprecated and you know, we all go about our lives much happier. But we can only do this if we can get everyone to agree that this is the way to go. And this is part of our, our mission to try to get everybody to agree on the path that we sh should take. One way I think it's interesting to think about whether this is a good way to go is to look at history and see where we came from. Uh, jQuery, as I said earlier, is designed to normalize browser behavior, to make it so that all the browsers kind of look the same. At the time jQuery was created, there were two really different event models. There was Internet Explorer, and there was the W3C event model. Uh, I, I've laid out a few of the, uh, a very few of the small differences that were between those two um, uh, models. And when you think about it, we even haven't yet completely escape these problems. I mean, if you're using IE8, how many of you actually have to develop for IE8? There's too many hands up. Um, so we have not escaped these problems. Th this event model, the reason why you probably are saying, I don't remember all of these problems, is because 
Even when you're developing for IEA, jQuery smooths this over for you. It's that layer of software that makes sure you don't have to deal with this junk. Um, but the inconsistencies that we see in pointer models are bringing back this same kind of issue where there's two very different ways to do things and uh, a model that is flawed. The model of touch events is very similar to the one that Internet Explorer made up for handling events you know, back long ago. So think about what, this is what it was like 10 years ago. And, and 10 years, I don't know, depending on how old you are, 10 years either seems like a long time because you were in you know, high school or it's a short time ago. And for me, it's a short time ago. Internet Explorer was 90% of the browser market. Now, obviously, at the time, browsers, it was all desktop, really. There was no mobile devices to speak of. But 90% of the market was Internet Explorer. Firefox had a tiny little slice. It was growing. That bright yellow slice, Netscape. Anybody remember Netscape? So this is the, I'll, I'll have to make sure that you notice that the graph is very similar, but it did change. This is the mobile browser share 10 years later. That big blue slice, that's Safari, Chrome, and Android, essentially Google and Apple. And uh, they dominate with about 90% the mobile market. Very similar market share wise to what Internet Explorer had 10 years before. And I feel like at this point, we've, uh, we've had Apple and uh, Google say, touch events are a de facto standard. We really, we're, you know, yeah, they've got their problems, but you, know, you guys can live with it. You can figure out some way to paint a piece of software over that it'll get rid of these problems. What if this had happened 10 years ago? What if Internet Explorer said, I events are de facto standard and you guys should not move forward? We'd still be stuck with the Internet Explorer 8 event model. And believe me, you don't want to be stuck with the Internet Explorer 8 event model. And really, Internet Explorer, uh, Microsoft dragged their feet on, on browsers you know, for quite a while, saying, well, we really don't want to do anything. Yet that Firefox slice and eventually the Chrome slice started getting bigger and bigger. And, and they changed their mind. And they built a really good browser in Internet Explorer 11. But we still have to deal with these problems of legacy browsers. And one day, we'll be in the future. And Internet Explorer 8 will be gone. And I hope that one day we'll be in the future and we will be rid of touch events and we'll be with a single pointer event model. Why isn't Chrome Pro pointer events? I, I think it's the problem that they are tied, for better or worse, to Apple, and Apple just doesn't want to even talk about this. It's a relationship problem, you know? Like, I ask my wife what's wrong, and she says nothing, and I know I'm in trouble. So <laughs> this, is, this is the problem. We have a big player that is uh, in Apple that is important, and, and the Chrome folks would really like to bring in everyone, and that's understandable, but we can't hold up the industry in order to satisfy one player who doesn't want to move forward. We didn't do it for Internet Explorer, and we shouldn't do it for Apple uh, with Safari. And why does it matter to you? Because pointer input is a critical part of it, user interfaces. It's like the way that we interact with our devices. We only currently have a standard for mouse. We really need a standard for touch. And just because Apple won't standardize, um, I don't think that should be blocking us. So I have a call to action here. Um, first of all, get to know why pointer events are, are important. Um, we, uh, jQuery Foundation, called a, a group of people together to discuss it, including all the browser makers. There's a link here to uh, the meeting notes. And uh, there's a currently a ticket that was closed by Chrome saying they have currently no interest in implementing pointer events. If you go there and you star that ticket, that will give them an idea that developers have more of an interest than they think they currently do. Um, and please do support the jQuery Foundation in our efforts to move standards ahead on your behalf. Um, 
So that's pretty much all I have. I did have something to make you realize that you, no matter how bad your life is, it could be a lot worse. Um, that was a brand new Tesla. Woman was buying it for her husband as a, as a surprise gift. She drove it, she hit the gas, she ran into the sign. I bet you that was a really good gift, don't you think? I, w I just felt, for, when I saw that, I thought, oh man, there's gotta be a horrible story behind that, and there was, so. That's all I've got. If you've got some questions, I'd love to take your questions. Somebody has to have a question. It can be about anything. There's one. Thank you, Mr. Icebreaker. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the overall mission of the jQuery Foundation. And you talked a bit about some of the, some of the parts of your mission, like pushing standards through and whatnot, but just, um, I guess, in a more general sense. Thank you. Uh, do you have some specifics uh, about the mission that you're interested in? Um, I mean, I, uh, I went through, you know, we, we definitely are pushing standards. We're collaborating with other groups that are creating open source, uh, you know, other open source projects. Um, if you got some specifics, I, I'd be glad to clarify them. Or I guess I, I had always assumed it was to further jQuery, but it sounds more like it's furthering the open web or furthering. It, it is, and, and I'm glad you, um, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. We, it's not just, and that's why I said, uh, similar to what Brian LaRue said about PhoneGap, you know, our goal isn't just to kind of make, it's not to preserve oursel ourselves as jQuery into eternity. We, you know, we want to be helping web developers get their jobs done. And right now, one of the tools that they use is jQuery. But, um, you know, that's, that's our reason for existing as a, uh, as a foundation, is really to help developers get their work done, not just to continue to develop jQuery to the exclusion of all else, so. Hi, uh, I had a question about the, uh, the touch events. You mentioned that um, uh, touch is more relevant to apps than the web, but what about a web app? Um, yeah, I, you know, uh, it's, what a web app is, like a single page app on the web, is that an app? Um, I think the, there's, it's nice that everything uses web technologies, like PhoneGap, for example. It's great that you can build an app that you sell in the store and still use HTML and JavaScript and CSS to build it. Um, ideally, that should just be a crutch. Ideally, you should just be able to go somewhere on the web, you know, have a bookmark on your, on your phone that you click on and it opens up a web browser and does what you want it to do without having to wrap something and pay a toll to someone who's selling it in the store. That's, that's a philosophical thing, but. Hi. I think this touches on what you just said, but uh, I work for a company who does responsive web design, and so we have one site for mobile to desktop, and what you're talking about, um, do you think that, that we're going in a direction where uh, it's more one site for all browsers, or do you imagine a different site for different devices just wrapped differently? I, I love responsive design, so I'm glad you're doing that. I, I'm glad that you're building responsive sites, uh, and we have, we've been supporting initiatives like the picture element to, to allow better use of bandwidth on mobile devices. I don't think, um, there's anything necessarily wrong with different specialized interfaces for certain devices, but I think responsive design doesn't get the, the positive attention that it should get because it's a great way to work. Again, that's my opinion. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious if there's any discussion about uh, even going beyond the browsers and um, mobile devices as such. Uh, PhoneGap gives you that, uh, you know, the native experience, but. Windows, I know, has uh, you know, the tiles. I can't remember exactly what they're called, but um, they're able to build HTML5 applications for the desktop as well. And there's lots of um, uh, like uh, WebDriver, I think. Is, no, sorry, that's uh, Node WebKit is what I was going to go with. And I think Intent was a new one that came out, I believe, uh, that allows you to write native applications for the desktop. I wonder if there's any like discussion on that level. Well, I guess in terms of uh 
in terms of what ideally I'd like to see, I think open web is really the way to go. Any place, any time we can get some or most of those technologies implemented somewhere else, it's great. Uh, Microsoft has their own uh, technology uh, stack that they use for building web-based applications that isn't really quite open web doesn't necessarily emphasize the use of a lot of these open source tools. You can use jQuery inside of it, but uh, I'd, pref again, prefer to see more people using the web, and we need to figure out ways to fix whatever the perceived problems are with web platform so that it can uh, compete against uh, app store type apps. Yeah, I was wondering if you could expand on some of your collaborations. You had mentioned Dojo earlier in the slides, and I was wondering if you could expand on some of the other collaborations with other foundations that are going on. Most of those aren't in a point where I think we're, I mean, we've, we've had open discussions with them, but we haven't really announced any specific uh, outcomes of those. In particular with Dojo, we're working with them on the pointer events um, issue because they're strong advocates as well. We're hoping that when we get multiple frameworks that are interested in a common underlying technology, that that should be a sign to the browser makers that maybe that technology is one they should pay attention to. How are we doing on time? We have none left. Then in that case, I will say goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>